He is risen. risen Amen. I pray that you will never get tired of saying that. That 2,000 years ago, Jesus came in flesh. Jesus being God, eternal God who created everything out of nothing. Oh, can you, did anybody see the stars this past week? Weren't they glorious? Stars and then the sun with all this smoke haze from Northwestern or Ontario fires. The, the glory of the heavens just shout out. And Jesus created everything out of nothing by a spoken word. How awesome. And 2,000 years ago for Jesus to take upon himself human flesh, to be born as a baby. Can you, come on, can you imagine God as a baby? And you're holding him in your, hand, in your arms and you realize this is the one who brought everything into being, everything into existence. Of course, we know that he died on the cross and he paid our sin in his own body. He suffered what we deserve as God the Father put the penalty of sin on Jesus who knew no sin uh, so that we might go free by faith. What a message. But of course, we know what happened on Sunday. What happened? He rose. He came from the grave in glorified form. He lives forevermore. Right now, he's seated at the right hand of the Father. I mean, that's not his only place he moves around. But he is coming. That's his, that's his place of, and position of power and authority. But he is coming back for the church. It's in the rapture. I cannot wait. I, every day I pray, come Lord Jesus, come. And I pray he comes even today. So welcome to Faith Baptist, whether you're here in person or maybe you're viewing us on our live stream. I want to say welcome to Faith. What an exciting week we've had. It's been a great week of ministry. A lot of good times together to build one another up. We're going to be in Romans chapter 10 this morning. And I'm looking forward to our time together in the Word of God. Well, um, at this time, I'd like us all to sing together a great song of victory. It's one of my favorites, Victory in Jesus. The words will be on the screen. Maybe if you'd like to take your hymnal, it's hymn number 499. Let's stand together and sing praise to the Lord for the victory found in Jesus.
opening for prayer. Our Father in heaven, we bow before you and we praise you over and over and over for the victory that is found in Jesus Christ alone. Oh, there is not enough good keeping that we could do. There's not enough religion. There's, not en there's nothing we can do to please you. We have sinned against you and rebelled against you by thought, word, and deed. We have separated ourselves from you who alone are most holy. But I'm thankful that through Jesus' death for our sin and through his bodily resurrection and by faith alone, you have brought us back to yourself. And what great victory that is. And I cannot wait for the day when the trump sounds and we hear the voice of the archangel and we see our Savior as we are caught up in the clouds. Oh, come, Lord Jesus, come quickly. And then forever we will be in heaven where there's no sin around us and no sin in us. What a complete salvation you have given us. And we praise you and thank you over and over in Jesus' name. Use this service, Father, for your honor and glory. Strengthen our faith. Save the lost. Give courage to the discouraged. Give strength to those who are faint-hearted and uphold the weak, Father. We praise you and thank you for all things in Christ. Amen. Amen. All right, you may be seated. I love the word of God. It is pure. It is holy. It is food for our soul. It is light to our path. One of my favorite psalms is Psalm 63. I don't know. What are you hungry for? Uh, we had some jelly donuts downstairs. I don't know. You eat one and then you don't feel so good. But, you know, we are all hungry and thirsty throughout this journey on earth. And King David, King David had lost a lot. He had lost his kingdom. He had lost his, his through his son's treason and rebellion. He was, he was just, David had been betrayed and lost, and he's in the wilderness. And there's one thing that he wanted. And I would think, what, like, what would he want? A Big Mac meal? I mean, would he want, like, a, a free vacation out of this kind of life? He said the thing that he hungers and thirsts for is the presence of God. He wanted the presence of God in his life. So when we read the psalm together, it's 11 verses, it is absolutely Magnificent. Let's read together. O oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. So I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory because your loving kindness is better than life. My lips shall praise you. Thus I will bless you while I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise you with joyful lips. When I remember you on my bed, I meditate on you in the night watches, because you have been my help. Therefore, in the shadow of your wings, I will rejoice. My soul follows close behind you, your right hand upholds me, but those who seek my life to destroy it shall go into the lower parts of the earth. They shall fall by the sword. They shall be a portion for jackals, but the king shall rejoice in God. Everyone who swears by him shall glory, but the mouth of those who speak lies shall be stopped. Praise God. Isn't that great? I just read that. I thought, listen to this. Again, you already read it, but because your loving kindness is better than life. David was like, I would rather have your favor and grace on me than another day of existence on this earth. That's a great attitude. Hey, just thinking about life on earth, I just want to say a quick happy birthday to a few people. Ruthie. Ruthie Skog is, is her birthday today. Happy birthday. birthday. Happy birthday to you. Clayton. Clayton Lund. Happy birthday to you. And Karen Kuza. Karen, happy birthday to you. Praise God. And Jeanette just had a birthday, so happy birthday to Jeanette. And um, God bless you all. Happy Eric. Birthday, oh, I know. Okay. <laughs> I know. I didn't say that because I just really, I just wanted to recognize these, uh, these uh, others. But yeah, happy birthday to a lot of birthdays on July 18th. All right. Um, Eric, come on up. Thank you. Good morning. Yes, happy birthday, everybody. Melissa was complaining, complaining to me this morning that it's getting the cost the candles are costing more than the birthday cake for Brian now, so, so, so. But basically with, with Clayton and Ruthie, with their birthday cakes, you could roast marshmallows over their cake. With Pastor, you could roast a turkey with all his kind of stuff, but, but. Pa 
pastor was, he was born in, I got some interesting, night, pastor was born in 1967. Just some, um, the average cost of a new house was 14000 The price of gas was $0.33. Cents. Um, the average uh, income per year was for a job was 7300 That's pretty good. That's what pastor makes now as a pastor. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, uh, and minimum wage was $1.40, so... But, so happy birthday to all them people. Uh, 1967 was a good year. Was it? <laughs> wow. Well, sometimes I feel old, but now I feel pretty young, so. But um, we do have a few um, announcements, a bunch of them actually. We'll start with tonight, Pastor Wyatt will be preaching part two of his believer's baptism. So tonight, you want to be here at 6 p.m. for church. And then Tuesday, there is a worship um, soul winning program that they've started at 6.30 um, p.m. at Deb Rock's home and on Masabi, that area. So if you need more information about that, see Pastor Wyatt. Wednesday is normal 6.30 p.m. praise and prayer. Um, and youth group with Pastor Wyatt. And then keep this in back in mind, Wednesday, July 28th, um, there's going to be a business quarterly business, quarterly business meeting. On, and Jul Saturday, July 31st, Tom Meyer will be here presenting his archeology span and the Bible seminar, which kind of fits in with um, our theme for VBS this year. Uh, which is DIG, and, and VBS is August 1st through August 4th. So that's coming up real quick. There is a meeting today, right after the morning service, for everybody that's going to be involved in VBS. Uh, so you can come up here and meet Pastor Wyatt. Also after this um, morning service, there is a child safety meeting. And if you want to help out with VBS and you haven't went through that meeting, that's um, a requirement. And Vic is going to be leading that right after church. I told it takes 20 to 30 minutes. So you have to get that done before you can help in VBS. So that's mandatory. So all that's going on after church this morning up front. And then um, August 8th, a Sunday, um, after the morning service, we'll be going over to the board church home on Pike Lake um, for baptism. So if you're interested in being baptized, see Pastor Wyatt or Pastor Brian, and they can give you more information, but that's August 8th. There'll be a, the morning service, and we'll have a church picnic out there, and then baptism, so. Um, or, yeah, there'll be food. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, everybody brings something. And so that's August 8th. Um, I believe that is it. Yes, so our next song will be um, Glorious Day. Thank you. 
So as usual, we'll spend some time praying for our missionaries and also for an unreached people group. Um, but first, a uh, quick review. We went camping uh, at Gooseberry Falls this last Thursday through Friday, and we met up with the youth group from my home church that I grew up in, in Ray, Minnesota, up by International Falls. Uh, so that was really a, a blessing of a time to connect with you know, different people from another church that are like-minded and believe in the same things. That's always a blessing. The kids had fun. Um, hiking the water was really low but that meant more rock climbing for the youth kids so that was um, a good time we spent uh, some time studying some different parables of Christ as well so really looking into those and um, and how those can shape our lives looking in the future one one about how we how we use our money how we use our time stewardship was a theme of one of them and then the other one the one that I focused on was um, our speech how we talk and how that can Really how it's what we say is what defiles us. Remember when Jesus was teaching, it's not what you eat that defiles you, right? Because the Pharisees are talking about eating with unwashed hands. But ultimately it's what you say, what comes from the heart that defiles. And how it's important to examine where we are. Are we even in the faith, looking at our hearts in the first place? And then if we are, how is our speech and how, how does that reflect where our heart is at? But overall, it was, it was a fun trip, uh, went well. So for all that came and um, parents that supported that, that was uh, a blessing, which Lord willing, in the future, we can do something similar as well. So our unreached people group is the Samah Sindhi, and they are in Pakistan. So this is a group of about 1.3 million people that's in Pakistan there. And as of right now, 0% uh, for Christians, once again. Uh, so another week, another large group of people that we see uh, that are in this group is Islamic. They do have the complete scriptures uh, in their own language, but once again, another group that is unreached, a group that does not know, well, they know of a Jesus through the Quran, but they do not know the true Jesus. They do not know the true God or the gospel. And typically, as we've been talking about before, these people groups are very difficult to reach, especially those that are Islamic, right? We talked about this um, last week as well, with being, um, being a Muslim is part of their entire culture. Right? It governs everything they do from even day-to-day -day business. It's not just a, you know, a once-a-week service that they go to right, in the mosque. This is everything. Their whole family is built around this religion. So going in to reach these people is a very difficult thing. But it has been done, and I'm confident that it will be done with this group as well in the future. So we'll be praying for them. And then also we, we will be praying for Grace and Randy Chauvin. Uh, they are evangelists that travel the country and the world that we support here as a church. Um, right now, they're actually working with the church and doing VBS stuff. Uh, so we'll be praying for them this morning as well. So let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we are thankful for the gospel as always. Lord, we're thankful for the resurrection of Christ that uh, we can have a renewed relationship 
um, with our Father, through Jesus Christ, through faith alone and trusting in him. Father, we're thankful that it's by grace. We're thankful that we can't work our way there. Uh, Father, for none of us would ever be able to, to do enough works to ever please you. Father, we're born into sin, and we sin on our own accord as well. Lord, but we're thankful for the way, the provision of Jesus Christ and his death on the cross. Lord, we're thankful um, even for this group in Pakistan. We pray that you would be raising up uh, missionaries, Father, whether single people, whether families, Lord, that they would commit their lives to learning the language, being diligent in study, Father, and uh, going over to this people group to plant churches that can reproduce. Father, we long for the day, even in our own lifetime, when there will be believers in this in this group here in Pakistan. Lord, so we ask that your will would be done and that your word would go forth over there in Pakistan and in the Middle East regions, Father. And uh, for those that are going and that are over there already in these areas, we ask that your hand would be over them, that despite the persecution, that they would continue to be faithful and they would be bold witnesses for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, we lift up Grace and Randy Chauvin as well. Uh, their ministry of evangelism as they travel from church to church or to different areas all across the country and all across, across the globe as well. Father, we ask that your hand would be upon them, that you would go out and do the work, even specifically as they work with VBS. Uh, Father, that uh, the hearts of these, these children would be softened, that you would draw them to yourself and that you would use um, Randy and his preaching, that you would use Grace as well in her ministry uh, for these kids to hear the gospel. Uh, that kids would be saved, that um, eternal souls will be won, uh, Father, to you through their ministry and, uh, Father, through the gospel and through their evangelism as well. Lord, we lift up our country. We pray for those in high positions, as Paul commands us, Lord, that they would be governing according to God's law, not according to their own laws that they make. Father, and may the laws that they pass, that they put through office, Father, and through legislation, that they would be in accordance to your word. Lord, may you raise up more godly people in our government system, Father, and may you convert those who are ungodly in our government system, that they may be worshipers of you. Father, help us to be diligent as a church, to be evangelizing our local area as well. Continue to put it on our hearts to reach the lost, Father, and continue uh, building a culture of evangelism within this church here in Hermantown. Father, we're thankful for your grace, the amazing things that you are doing uh, Father, through this church and through the believers that are in this building this morning. And we're thankful for Jesus Christ. And we ask these things in his name. Amen. So our next song will be Jesus is Mine.
Good morning. Good morning. Scripture reading today will be in Romans 10, verses 1 to 13. Let's begin. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. For Moses writes about the righteousness, which is of the law. The man who does those things shall live by them. For the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down from above, or who will descend into the abyss, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart, that is the word of faith which we preach, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, Whoever believes on him will not be put to shame, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Junior church is also dismissed. Praise God. Wow, great praise, great praise to the Lord in singing and in prayer, scripture reading. Wow, my heart is blessed. Um, thank you, young people, for being up here. Praise God for all of our families and all of our children. Wow, God is good. So you have your Bibles open to Romans chapter 10. Remember where this fits in, the whole plan of the book of Romans. That God directs the Apostle Paul to start out the first three chapters speaking about the wrath of God. Not a pleasant subject, but it's one that we all need to hear. That God is angry with sinners, and his wrath is upon all mankind. It makes no difference. He looks at all mankind in three groups. There's the rebellious. They know there's a God by intelligent design. They can see creation shouts the glory of God. They know this is no accident. They know this didn't evolve from some, some cosmic explosion billions and billions of years ago. But they want to live deliberately wicked lives. They love their own sin, and so they deliberately reject the knowledge of God. God says they are under God's wrath. The second group, they're the self-righteous. They're the ones that say, well, I don't do what they do. I'm not so bad. You know, I may do a little bit of this and a little bit of that, but I've never killed anybody. Um, hey, guess what? All of the self-righteous are under the condemnation of God, and they will suffer his wrath. The third group that Paul identifies are the religious. They have, a code, they have a code book. They have a list of do's and don'ts. Do this, do this, don't do this, don't do this. And they think by doing that, they will somehow accomplish this righteousness of God. And God looks at them and says, you also fall under my wrath. Remember that sword of Damocles? How Damocles was like, oh, I just want to, like, I'd love to sit on the throne and be king for one day. And his friend, the king, said, okay, Damocles, come on up and you can sit at my banqueting table and enjoy all the feasting and festivities. And he's sitting there at the table and ah, gorging himself and the music and everything. And he looks up and he sees the sharpest sword that if it falls on him, it would divide him in half. And it is hanging by a horsehair. The message is, it is really no fun being the king because the judgment could come swift and, and fast on you. So, so the wrath of God is on all the world 
And there's only one escape, and it is in the person and the work of Jesus Christ, his son. So that's the next part of Romans. The next part speaks about the grace of God. So we've got the wrath of God, beginning in chapter 3, verse 21, the, the grace of God, which overwhelms the sin. Isn't it wonderful? God's mercy and his grace and his forgiveness overwhelms all of the sin because of Jesus' death for our sin and his resurrection. And then now in chapters 9, 10, and 11, the question is, what is God's plan for Israel? Since Israel is God's chosen people, and in chapter 9, verse 4, they have seven phenomenal blessings that no other nation has ever received. God has given to no other nation what he has given to Israel. He has given to Israel in adoption, a special relationship as an, as an adopted child of the, of the Heavenly Father. He has given Israel the glory. His, he said, Israel, I'm going to make my home with you. I will live among your people. No other nation did God say that to but Israel. Then he goes on and he says in chapter, four, nine, chapter 9, verse 4, God gave the covenants, he gave the law, he gave the service or the worship of God and the promises of whom ultimately Christ came to fulfill. All of these blessings came to Israel. If anybody's going to believe in Jesus as Messiah, it's got to be Israel. The question is, why didn't they believe? Why did the church begin Jewish and then quickly turn over to Gentiles? And the answer is because of the hardness of Israel's heart. Israel was set, had set themselves against God because they loved their idolatry. They rejected his word. They rejected his prophets, just like Pharaoh in Egypt. Remember Pharaoh in Egypt? Let my people go. Uh, let me think about it. No. Let my people go. Uh, let me think about it. I know there's been some plagues, but those are over. No. And then eventually he said no so many times that God confirmed him in his hardness. So that finally, the firstborn of all the land died and perished. So God was, making a, was showing a pattern. Just like Pharaoh hardened his heart and suffered the judgment, Israel hardened their heart over year after year, generation after generation, until finally God said, okay, you want, a, you want a hard heart? I'll confirm you in it. I'll set you in what you want. And as a result of their hardness of heart, when Jesus showed up, they turned him over to the Romans to be crucified. So even though it was terrible and ugly and hard, yet out of it came the death of Jesus, which saves the soul of every man and woman who believes, right? So what's the warning? If your heart is growing hard to the Lord, stop. Put the brakes on. Soften your heart. Re return to him. Run to him. Pursue him by faith alone. Do not harden your heart because there could come a day when God just says, that's what you want, I'll give it to you. And you'll be in darkness. Let's hope that doesn't happen. So then, at the end of chapter 9, Paul says, but wait a minute, this whole hardness of heart and rejection of the Messiah was prophesied in the Old Testament. It's not a surprise. God knew what was going to happen, and he allowed it to happen so that only a remnant of Israel would believe and be saved. It was foretold. So every Jewish person should realize this is just the, the truth of God's word playing itself out in their lives. And now we come to chapter 10. If chapter 9 is all about the potter and the clay, where Israel could say, but God, you made me like this. You made us a nation, and then you hardened our heart, so you made us act like this. God says, no, you have human responsibility. So chapter 10 is all about Israel's responsibility to the gospel. And I'm going to challenge you. You have a responsibility to the gospel. What you're going to hear today requires a response of some kind. And I'm going to share those at the end. Let's dig into it. I'm, I really have two points. My first point is Israel's rejection of God was their own responsibility. So that's chapter 10, verses 1 through 3. Brethren, uh, well, actually, let's pray. Father, as we bow to your word now and we have fit this chapter into its context and we have sung from our hearts and we have heard the scriptures read and we have read them ourselves. You alone are great. You alone are God. And we humble ourselves before you. And we heed and, and pay attention to your word. And I would pray, Father, that you would change our hearts. Even my heart, which still needs growth in Christ. It needs, it needs refining. I pray that you would humble me and allow me to be taught from your word this morning. And so make us more like Christ, Father. And for those who do not believe, 
who are in the same position as Old Israel, Old Testament Israel, and even New Testament Israel, um, I pray that they will put their faith in Jesus, lest their hearts grow hard and be confirmed in darkness. So again, I thank you for your grace and mercy, which is so abundant and so satisfying. Oh, we love you, Father, and we love you, Jesus Christ, and we love you, Holy Spirit. Amen. So chapter 10, let's read uh, again the first three verses. Here is Israel's rejection of God. It's their responsibility. Verse 1, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel, Paul says, is that they may be saved. Sounds a lot like the beginning of chapter 9, where Paul said, I would be willing to go to hell. I would be willing to leave my salvation and actually go to hell into a lake of fire where my skin is burning, my hair is burning, my eyelids are burning, liquid fire is going into my throat, and I am in constant torture, not just for one minute, not for ten minutes, but for all eternity. Paul says, I would take that if only my Jewish countrymen would be saved. Listen, he, he had a heart for the lost, didn't he? Uh, we, if anything, church... We have got to look at this world and not look with scorn. I mean, sure, we can judge and scorn, or what, but we need to look at this world through the lens of Christ where we weep for those who perish. Weep. 95 people every minute die all across this globe. Literally, every time that my fist is pounding, somebody is dying on this planet. They're taking their last breath, and either they are going to eternal fire and torture and torment, or they're going to eternal happiness and joy. That's it. There's only two options. And Paul's like, sure, my countrymen, they, they create riots, they stone me to death, they hate me, they persecute me, but I love them and I want them saved. I want them born again. Listen, that is the heart we need to have for this world. We need to look out to this world and say, they need the gospel and I have it. I need to, I need to deliver it. I need to give it. And so Paul's weeping again. His heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. So why are they not saved? Verse 2, Paul says, For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. Man, religious people have zeal. You know, they do. They have great zeal. I remember dr traveling down the, the King's Highway in the country of Jordan. Um, my nephew Jake and I were, were riding together. We're going down the ancient King's Highway, and all of a sudden I see limousines and sedans of all kind, kinds pulling off into the desert, literally jam throwing their cars into park, and grown men in business suits, like I'm talking $5,000, $8,000 business suits, and, um, and others in robes. They are grabbing little rolled-up ro ro rugs from their back seat, they're going into the desert, laying the rugs down, and praying to Allah facing Mecca. They do that five times a day. The Muslims do. They find, figure out where is Mecca, and they bow down five times a day. I don't care if they're in the middle, if they're in the middle of a, a stock market transaction. I don't care what they're doing. They will stop, and they will put their rug down, and they will bow. Is that zeal? Oh, man, that is zeal. But, but without knowledge. And zeal without knowledge is no good. It, it means nothing. It, it, it profits them nothing. I was waiting for Melissa at a store, no surprise, and she was in there doing some shopping, and I had my window down. I'm, paying, I'm minding my own business, reading, and I have my window down, and a, a girl comes up to me, and she's like, uh, excuse me, sir, and I thought maybe she was lost or needed help, and, and, and she's like, can I talk to you for a minute? I'm like, um, sure, go ahead. And she goes, I want to tell you about Jesus. And I was like, really? She's a Jehovah's Witness. Yeah. And she's like, I'm, and I watched her. She went car to car to car of men waiting for their wives. And, and, she, and I was like, talk about zeal. Talk about zeal, right? You got people with rosary beads. I don't care what it is. They have a zeal for God. But, it, but it's without knowledge. So you know what the Jewish people did for their zeal for God? They're like, all right, okay, Jewish people, we are going to please God by obeying the Ten Commandments. But you know what? These Ten Commandments, ah, they're not crystal clear. So we're going to take the law about the Sabbath, keep the Sabbath holy, and so we never break that. We're going to make up some man-made rules so we never get close to breaking God's rule. So then they made up ten rules. 
And then they thought, well, wait a minute, somebody could slip through that fence of 10 rules, so we're going to make 10 more rules. Then we're going to make 10 more rules. So we're going to make so many rules that you'll never get to break in the one rule because we've got so many rules. We are so zealous for God. They thought they could attain God's righteousness by rule keeping, by following the law. If we just don't break this one command, like God said, and so now we're not going to break these 11 commands and 21 commands and 121 commands, and ultimately they have a whole code book of how you can not break the law, but, but, but you can break the law and not break the law. I mean, they, they're clever. They, they've got it, but they're zealous. Literally in Israel, you, on a Sabbath day, you can only walk within the community, within the village. So they have movable, they have movable posts that show you the city limits. All you have to do is grab one of those posts, put it in your car, you can drive as far as you want because you've got the city limits with you. You're staying within the city limits on the Sabbath. They have made a rule, they have made a rule that you can, you can fly over water on the Sabbath. Of course, they didn't have planes back then, so Moses never dealt with it, but they said you can fly over water because business people need to get across the Atlantic Ocean to do business in New York. So yes, if it's the Sabbath, you can fly over water, but you cannot fly over land. God says that would be for breaking the Sabbath. And so a man needed to go from a lot down up to Tel Aviv, crossing land on the Sabbath, and he's like, I got to get up there, but I can't break the law. So he bought a hot water bottle, filled it with water. He sat on it on his plane, in his plane seat, and he justified, I'm now flying over water. Technically, he was, but, but do you see what I'm saying? Talk about zealous. The problem with zeal without knowledge is it leads you to nothing. It leads you to an empty, vain religion. And it does not please God. So this is Israel's problem. They have a zeal. They have a desire. They want, they want God's righteousness. Verse 3, For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, but seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. They thought, we want God's righteousness, but the only way we're going to get it is by doing good, by law-keeping. God said, can't, you can never do it. You'll never be able to meet me at 100% perfection because God requires 100% perfection in the law for somebody to be saved. You want to be saved by the law from conception, the whole time in the womb, coming out, you can never ever commit a sin. Think a sin, have a sin. You can't even have a sin nature, which excludes all of us. So... So this is Israel's rejection of God. It's their, it's their responsibility to seek God, not by law keeping, but by faith. So for me, I'm, I'm, I'm like Israel. I, I was seeking God by law keeping. I just thought, if I'm good enough, if I just try hard enough, God has got to like me. And I could not find him. And I sought for him, and I sought for him. And I, I would go four days without eating and without talking to anybody, thinking if I could lead a monastic lifestyle, I know God's going to shine down his favor upon me, and I'm going to have this great peace. So I would, I would go through these periods of seeking God and doing all sorts of religious rituals, and, and nowhere could I find him, and I was angry. And I thought, he is a bad God, and I'm a good guy, and this is a terrible situation. I just don't like this, this God up in heaven. He cannot be found, and if there's anybody that could get to heaven on this planet, it's got to be me. And then when I, um, after when I was 26, and having come to the end of myself, literally, with an attempt of suicide, in the hospital, I, I, I got it. I was, reading, I was reading 1 John 1, 7 through 9, and it was like, wait a minute. I'm not a good guy seeking righteousness of God, and he's a bad God. I am a horrid, wretched sinner who has separated myself from God, and I'm trying to get back to him with my own works, and he will not accept my works. It is all by Jesus Christ alone. I, then I got it. It's not by law keeping. It's by faith. I put my faith in Jesus, and like a, a peace flooded my soul. It was absolutely amazing, and has not, has not left or changed since. Well, that was my first point. Here's my second point. Sounds easy, right? My second point has three parts to it. But my second point is this. Here is God's remedy for Israel's rejection. Israel rejected God's way of righteousness and wanted to do it on their own through law keeping, through the law. And God said, no way. Here's my remedy. Verse 4. So this is going to take us to the end of the chapter. Hold on tight. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. 
Anyone, so what's the answer to the seeking God through, through the law? You can't do it. You will fail, and having failed, you will perish. The end of the law of righteousness, you see, notice it says this, for Christ is the end of the law, of the law for righteousness. Go back up to chapter 9, verse 31. Look at chapter 9, verse 31. But Israel, pursuing the law of righteousness, has not attained to the law of righteousness. They wanted God's righteousness. They sought it. They pursued it. But they could never achieve it. But Christ is the end of it. He's the fulfillment of it. He's the completion of it. To everyone who believes in Jesus the Messiah, you are, you are perfectly righteous. God looks at you as righteous as if you have never sinned. He looks at you as clean and pure as he looks at Jesus Christ. Christ is the end of the law of righteousness. But not to everyone. It's to everyone who believes. It's faith alone. Now, here's my three points for God's remedy. Number one, the gospel. Listen, everybody. First point. These are my three main points. So if you remember anything, remember these three things. Number one, the gospel is not mysterious or far from you. The gospel is not mysterious or far from you. As a, as a matter of fact, right now, whatever your spiritual condition is, the gospel is closer than you know. And that's what, he's, that's what Paul is going to show in the text, that this gospel that Israel rejected was not mysterious, it was not hidden, it was not far off. So he quotes Deuteronomy chapter 30. For Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law. Um, the man who does these things shall live by them. I said that, right? Leviticus 18, verse 5. If you want to live by the law, what's the requirement? 100% perfection. You want, to, you want to live according to the law? The man who does these things obeys all of the law perfectly. Well, then you'll have eternal life. What's the problem? No one can do it. No one can do it. Paul says this in Galatians Take your Bibles, hold your place there, go with me to Galatians chapter 3. Look at how Paul uses that same text. The man who does them shall live by them. Galatians chapter 3, verse 10. You're in Romans, just head over to the right, past the Corinthians, come to Galatians chapter 3, verse 10. For Here's how Paul writes it to the Corinthians. For as many as are of the works of the law, if you're trying to keep the law to, to achieve eternal life, you are under the curse. You're under God's wrath. For it is written, cursed is anyone or is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. You want to avoid the curse? No, this is, no, you want to avoid the curse? Just perfectly fulfill the law from conception to eternal life. Never, never, ever break the law. Well, we're all guilty. So he goes on, verse 11. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident. Here's why. For the just, those who are justified shall live by faith. Yet the law is not of faith. See, faith is trust and belief in the Lord Jesus. Law is keeping, is keeping it's doing. The law is doing so the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. Same verse as in Romans chapter 10. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. How? Having become a curse for us. He, he's our substitute. He took our punishment. He became a curse for us. Because cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. And when Jesus hung on the cross, he, was, he became our curse so that we could be set free. See how that works? Blessed is any man... Um, who trust Jesus. So let's go back to Romans chapter 10. Verse 6. So the righteousness of the law says you must keep the law perfectly to go to heaven. Nobody can do it. Here's the righteousness, verse 6, of faith. But the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth, and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. Okay, this is going to, stay with me now, everybody. This is, this, is, this is exciting how Paul is doing this. He is quoting Deuteronomy chapter 30. So let me set the scene for Deuteronomy chapter 30. Moses is at the end of his life. And he is talking to the next generation. 
that is going into the promised land, and he wants to remind them about how God gave the law. How did God give the Ten Commandments? And in Deuteronomy chapter, so let's, you need to go here, hold your place in Romans, go all the way back to the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, chapter 30. The reason I bring you here, I believe Paul is, is using this verse in context. He's using it exactly as how Moses spoke it. I'll prove that to you just in a moment here. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 11. He's telling the next generation, you need to put your faith in the Lord. You need, to, you need to trust the Lord, turn to the Lord and trust him. So verse 11, for this commandment, which I command you today, is not too mysterious for you. I'm in verse 11, chapter 30, verse 11. For this commandment, which I command you today, is not too mysterious for you, nor is it far off. He is talking about the law. The law was not mysterious, it was not hidden, and it wasn't something that they had to go search for. They didn't have to go to Super Walmart, go down aisle H, go to section 8B or whatever, and then look for it there. It was not mysterious, it was not hidden, it was not far off. As a matter of fact, God gave them and brought it right to them, right? How did he do that? Verse 12, the law, it is not in heaven that you should say, oh man, who's, who will ascend into heaven for us and bring it down that we may hear it? You know, Moses is saying, listen, everybody, when God gave us the law, none of us had to go around saying, all right, who's got an elevator high enough? Who's good at hiking? Can somebody go up to heaven, knock on God's door, get the law, bring it down? And the answer is no, that's not how it came. Then the next question, verse 13, nor is it beyond the sea that you should say, hmm, who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us that we may hear it? In other words, the word of God is not mysterious, it's not hidden, and it's not far from us. You, didn't, you don't have to go up and search for it in heaven. You don't have to cross the sea, whether you swim, row a boat, take all those months and years. And then you're like, oh, wait a minute, there's the law. Let's get it and bring it back to Israel. They never had to do that. Why? God gave them the law. He just brought it to them, right to them. As a matter of fact, he brought it so close, verse 14. But the word is very near you. How near is it? It is in your mouth and in your heart. Okay, see how, now do you see what Paul's saying in Romans? Paul's saying, just as God gave the law, and all they had to do was receive it. They didn't have to go up a mountain. Moses did, but the Israel didn't. They didn't have to cross a sea. It's not mysterious. It's not far off. It is so close. It's in your mouth and in your heart. Paul says, listen, Israel, the gospel is not mysterious. It's not hidden. You don't have to go up and bring Christ down from heaven. Um, God gave the Messiah just like he gave the law. The law came down the mountain with Moses. God, God the Father sent Jesus from heaven. When Jesus came from heaven, it's God coming to heaven, coming from heaven in human flesh, right? Instead of going across the sea to find the, the law, um, God said for the gospel, I just simply rose Jesus up from the dead. So there you have it. You have his coming down and dying on the cross and his rising from the dead. Look at how Paul, now Paul's going to make a play on two things. Christ coming down from heaven, Christ rising from the dead, and then he's going to make a play on mouth and heart. So if, see if you can follow his logic. Paul is absolutely brilliant. Remember, Christ coming down from heaven, rising from the dead, mouth and heart. Now look at this. Let's walk through it. Verse 5. I'm sorry, verse 6. But the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven? We don't have to ask that question. That is to bring Christ down from us. God did that himself. Christ came down from heaven. Verse 7. Or who will descend into the abyss, or literally, who will come across the sea, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. We don't have to do that. Jesus did it for us, right? In the same way that God gave the law, they didn't have to search for it. It was near them. So God brings the Messiah. We don't have to search for it. It is near us. It is right here. And then he says, verse 8, but what does it say? The word, this is the gospel message that we talk. The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. Notice, he said mouth and heart, right? The word, of, the word is near in your mouth and it's in your heart. What is this word? 
It is the word of faith, the gospel message which we preach. Remember, the gospel is Jesus coming down from heaven, rising from the dead. Good? Let's go to the next text and watch how this all comes together. This is God's remedy for Israel's rejection. They need to believe. That's it. Just believe. Not try to obey, not try to keep the law for salvation. They need to trust. Verse 8. What does it say? The word is near you. Here it is, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. Verse 9, he's going to use this now. That if you confess with your mouth, there's, see the word mouth is repeated. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. That refers back to verse 6. You know who the Lord Jesus is? Lord means master. He is not saying to be saved you need to make Jesus Lord of your life. He's not bringing some lordship salvation. What he's saying is, if you confess with your mouth that Christ came down from above. Christ is Lord, he came down from above. That's verse 6, the first part of Moses' statement. Who will ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above. That's if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. And believe in your heart, there's the word heart, that God has raised him from the dead. That's verse 7. The other part of the gospel, who will descend into the abyss? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. Now, confessing with your mouth and believing in your heart are not two different, it's not like Paul is saying your salvation is two different parts. Obviously, which one comes first? You believe in your heart. Then you confess. So chronologically, you believe in your heart, you confess with your mouth. But he starts off by saying, if you confess in your mouth that the Lord Jesus, meaning Jesus is the Lord, he has come down from heaven, and if you believe in your heart that Jesus raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You have eternal life. Verse 10, for with, and here's, how, here's the chronological order, for with the heart one believes unto righteousness. You want righteousness with God? It is faith alone, not law keeping. You will be saved. So with the heart, one believes unto righteousness, and, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. The word confess means to, to name the same. I need to speak with my mouth the same thing that I believe in my heart. So that's how it works. You believe in your heart, and then you'll confess with your mouth. And again, if you have a maybe you're mute, maybe you believe in your heart, and then you're suddenly killed, and you can never confess with your mouth you are still saved. You believe in your heart, you will be saved. Um, but he's playing the mouth and heart based on the Deuteronomy 30 text that we just read. So look at verse 10 one more time. Now with the heart, one believes into righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made into salvation. He's not done with the heart and mouth issue. He's still going to talk about it. Here's, here's, my third, here's my second point. So my first point is the gospel is not too mysterious and it's not, it's not far off. It is actually in your heart and in your mouth. You just need to believe. You need to trust. So do, have you put your faith in Jesus alone? If you have, you are saved. That's, that's it. That's it. It's so easy. If there's anything that I'd love to do that would really disrupt our area, it would be go to the religious centers, the churches that do not preach the gospel and go in there and preach the gospel. I would get thrown out. I, w I would get uh, abused terribly with all sorts of terrible things if I went into religious centers and said, religion will not get you to heaven. Faith alone will. Right? It will. That, that would bring riots and all sorts of problems. Maybe, maybe, but that's where people need to hear the gospel, those places. All right, now look, look at verse 11. My second point of this, of this God's remedy for Israel, not only is the gospel not mysterious, nor is it far off, but secondly, the gospel is available to everyone. Verse 11, for the, God, for the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. The gospel invitation is open to everybody of every culture and every race and every tongue and every age and every social status and every financial ability. The gospel is available to everyone. So it's not mysterious, it's not far off, and, and it's available. All you have to do is believe and you will never be put to shame. Listen, um, people have shamed me greatly over my faith. They've, they've said, wow, I can't believe you're such a, a loser to, think, to have to rely on Jesus. You know, can't you be strong and do your own thing and be your own man? 
And I'll tell you what, before Jesus, I will never be ashamed, ever. My faith is in him. I will stand with him in glory someday, and I will never be, be given, I, I will never be ashamed for having trusted Jesus, ever. And when I'm all giving the gospel to different people, whether it's at school or downtown or whatever, I'm not ashamed that people think I'm a religious freak or a Jesus fanatic. They can say what they want. I'm going to preach Jesus. I don't care what they say. Um, let's not be ashamed because we will never be ashamed for trusting him. Verse 12, for there is no dis distinction between Jew and Greek. It does not matter what race or culture or background you have. The same Lord over all, there's the word all again, is rich in his blessings of grace to all, there's the all again, who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. See, the gospel is available to everybody. So do you see the mouth and heart thing? Verse 11, whoever believes on him, that's a heart issue. Verse 13, whoever calls on the name, that's a mouth issue. But it's the same thing. You believe in your heart, you confess with your mouth. It's the same thing. All right, here's the problem. So everybody agree the gospel is not mysterious? Yeah, it's crystal clear. And does everybody agree that it's not far off? You don't have to go search for it. It is actually, I brought it right to you. It's in your mouth and it's in your heart right now. You just have to trust. Now, do you also believe that the gospel is available to all? Yes, yeah, I agree too, because that's what the Bible says. But wait a minute. Here's the great thing. Somehow, people need to hear the gospel. If it wasn't for my sister, I would not be saved. My sister begged me with the gospel. She pleaded with me, Brian, you got to believe in Jesus. Get out of my face, Karen. Come on to church. I'd be like, I don't want to go to church. I, don't want, I hate church. I hate religion. I don't like Jesus. Stay away from me. And then, that one, then she's like, well, come on a Sunday night. There's a cute girl here. You can sit next to her. And I'm like, I'll be there. What time? I mean, honestly, that's how I started coming to Faith Baptist. There was a cute girl that my, that my sister thought I might like to get to know. And then I did marry her. But not my wife. I was the pastor at her own wedding when she married somebody else. <laughs> that was awkward. If she's listening on the live stream, I'm sorry. She was in the wedding. But I was, when I married her to her husband, I was like, oh, boy, you're the whole reason I came to the Lord in the first place. I just thought you were cute. Um, but listen, we, listen, we, if we do not deliver the message, nobody's going to call on the name of the Lord. So we got a problem here. Verse 14, how then shall they, and this is again, the gospel's available to all. How then shall they call on him, that's with your mouth, in whom they have not believed, that's with your heart. The answer is they can't. Nobody can call on Jesus whom they believe if they've never heard the gospel. How shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? They can't do it. Nobody can believe in Jesus if they don't first know about him. How shall they hear without a preacher? Nobody can hear the good news of Jesus without a preacher. And how shall they preach unless they are sent? See, he's working backwards. Yeah. All right, guess what, everybody? I'm going to tell you the good news right now. John, according to John chapter 17, Jesus has already sent you out. Jesus said to the Father, as you have sent me out, so I send these people out. You are the sent one. By the way, the word preachers is not an official title for me. It's like I'm not the only one going out on the streets preaching the gospel. All of us who are born again believers are sent ones. We are all called to go and deliver the message. And if we don't deliver the message, they're not going to be able to hear the name of Jesus. If they don't hear the name of Jesus, they cannot believe in him. And if they do not believe in him, they cannot call on his name. And they are lost. We have a duty. Now, if any one of us came up with a cure for cancer, do you not, where would you be if you had a cure for cancer? You'd be on every major network, and they'd be interviewing you like hours upon hours upon hours and all of that. We've got better news than that. I mean, granted, cancer is a terrible thing. We have the message of eternal life, and we are sent ones. And guess what? What happens? We end up not sharing it. That's awkward. I wasn't going to throw this in, but do you, remember the, do you remember in the Old Testament the story of the, the four lepers? There were lepers that were outside of the gate um, the, of the city, and the city was being besieged. So nobody was in or out. Um, the, the enemy army was right outside, and, and the four lepers are, are outside the city because they're unclean. And days go on, and days go on, and the people inside the city are dying for famine, and the army is holding up outside there. 
And then one night, God causes the army to flee. And so the army disappears. But all of their tents and horses and everything are out there. And the four lepers look at one another and they're like, hmm, that was weird. The, ar- the enemy army's gone. I, maybe they're doing an ambush or something? I don't know. And so the lepers look at each other. They're like, well, if we stay here, we die. If we go in the city, we die, but that's locked. And if we go to the enemy army, we die. So either way, we die. Let's just go. So they go and they find out, sure enough, the entire army has disappeared. And there are empty tents with lots of food and horses and beds and blankets and pillows. And and they're having, can you imagine the four lepers? They haven't been around any contact with civilization for a long time. And they're like, look at this bed. I love this bed. Oh, this is so cozy. And let's turn the tunes on. And here's the food. And look at the horses we're having. And they look, they stop. They look at one another, and what do they say? Here's what they, here's what they say. It is not right that we are enjoying all of these things when the city is perishing inside. This is not right. It's almost like, man, did we have a good time this morning singing, huh? That, that was great. It's like, yeah, we're jumping around. We're not jumping around literally, but we're having a great time celebrating the Lord. Hmm, but it's not right that the rest of this world's not getting it. I'm sad that they're not joining us. So the lepers were like, okay, let's go to the city. So they knock on the gate. Get out, you lepers. No, but listen, we've got news. The army has disappeared, and there's lots of goods to plunder. And then the gates open, and and the city plunders the enemy army. Isn't that amazing? It's kind of parallel to to the gospel here. So... How shall, how shall anybody hear unless we go out and share the gospel? As it is written, look at verse 15, and this is probably where we'll close. As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace. You know what the gospel of peace is? Jesus' death and resurrection. Who bring glad tidings of good things. That's great. Hey, anytime, any, anytime somebody gives you good news, it's, it's a time to rejoice. Why are the feet beautiful? Well, here's why. The only way to deliver a message back in these days was by foot. You had to walk, get up, put one step in front of another, and soon you'll be walking out the door, right? You're, you just, you're, and, and then you are delivering the good news by foot because that's how people got around, by foot. So that's why the feet are beautiful, because the, these, these feet are moving on the sidewalks and the roadways to deliver the good news of Jesus so that those who hear can believe and call upon the name of the Lord. That is it. That's our duty. That is our responsibility. Now, can you imagine if all of us take this and all of us share the gospel with people around us this next week? I don't know, maybe um, 130 people Everybody, and I'm really, I'm a math teacher, but this, okay, let's just go easy. 10. We all, we all reach 10 people. I can multiply by 10. What's 130 times 10? 1,300 people will hear the good news and have an opportunity to be saved in the next week if we all reach 10 people. That is amazing. Don't you want that? I do. I do. It's great because that's beautiful. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring glad tidings of good things. So let's get our feet moving, share the gospel. So here are my two points about God's remedy. The gospel is not mysterious. It's close by. And secondly, the gospel is available to all. I'll save for next Sunday morning the, my third point that the gospel has not been believed by all, though. It's just that's the way it is. You're going to go out and give the gospel to many people, and some will not believe. Some will actually give you whatever kind of response. It's just, hey, that's just to be expected, right? All right, one last thing. Nobody is going to believe your message if your life doesn't back it up. If I'm downtown preaching the gospel on the streets and my life does not reflect Christ, nobody is going to give me two cents worth hearing. They're going to be like, Who's this, who's this um, shenanigan? No, who's this shyster or whatever? Just coming out to get something. There's some ulterior motive. No, but if, you're, if your life is like Christ and you're delivering the message, by the way, I don't like, you know, some people say, preach the gospel all times and, uh, and if necessary, use words. What? No, it is always necessary to use words. 
You preach the gospel all the time and use words when you do it. But also have a life that backs it up, right? Don't be living a contrary life. So we got lots to think about in this text, don't we? Maybe today you are like Israel or like Pharaoh. Your heart is hard and you have not, trust, you not, you have not put your trust in the Lord. Today could be your day of salvation. Now, granted, it is my birthday, July 18th, 19, thanks, Eric, 1967. Wow, if I could be an adult back then, life would be cheap. Um, well, not inflationary-wise. But, um, but listen, way more important than that is my spiritual birthday. Really, my, way more important than that is my spiritual, and I'm not even going to tell you when that is, but it's, I have a spiritual birthday, and you all do if you're born again. So, right, you live for the Lord. You trust him, you walk with him this week, and you get out there and share the gospel. It's good news. It's not, do not be ashamed. It is good, good news. All right. Father, we're thankful for this text. Thank you for this church family. Just the joy to be together, to sing and to praise. And I just think of Israel, how they rejected and rejected. And finally, after many years of hardness of heart, you confirmed that in them. And they rejected the Messiah. And now you've opened up the door to the gospel to the Gentiles. And we now believe and we're part of your family and how exciting that is. And I pray that um, those in our community will hear the gospel because we are sent from you to them. So give us blessing as we deliver the message of good news, of glad tidings. Some of us are going to do it by feet this week. Some will do it in their cars. Some will do it on social media. There's all sorts of avenues, Father, that we can declare the good news of Jesus. But just help us be really concerned for the lost. Help us to see everybody that we run into this week as a soul, an eternal soul that will either be at peace with you in heaven or in torment, separated for eternity in hell. Um, give us those eyes to see. I pray you'll continue to use this church for your glory and honor, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, everybody, have a fantastic day. We look forward to seeing you um, tonight at 6. Thank you.